All right. Try this again. <clears throat> it's not whiskey, it's tea. Just to let you know. Because I sound like shit. Um, okay. Uh, first off, I'm going to read off this because when they said they gave me an hour, I was like, shit, I got an hour? You know, how much am I going to write? Well, a lot. And, um, you know, I passed it by Steve and he was okay with it. So please bear with me for reading off a page. But I'm going to talk about um, espionage in the modern age of information warfare. And uh, as you can see from this slide, you know, there's a lot of different countries, a lot of different entities that are doing uh, espionage. And now that we've moved into the digital realm, they're all in on it as well. But first, who am I? Um, as Steve said, I'm a crabby old bastard online, tweeting about you know, the insanity of it all. Um, but uh, I've been called a security researcher, and I guess that's the, the thing that's stuck uh, the most. Um, <clears throat> and I end up getting myself in trouble a lot. Um, then it ends up in the news and... Uh, then I have to banish reporters because, well, except for Steve, because uh, usually I tell them things and then they go, yeah, right, okay, and they write something else that, you know, is a little more sexy. Steve tells is you know tells things as it is. So uh, right now I'm doing uh, OSINT forensics, uh, but in my off hours I do a lot of more interesting things with national security issues. Uh, but the real deal here is that I'm famous in Russia now. Uh, the error you see uh, above is a 451. That's what you get if you try to go to my domain in Russia. Uh, I have been marked either as uh, somebody who's got some copyright issues or I am a national threat. Um, I'm Because this is... Because this is uh, all about spycraft and all of us hacking the things, um, I'm going to go with national security threat. And um, the reason that I'll go with that more so than any kind of copyright issue is uh, because of oh, went too far. some of this stuff here. Um, as you can see, Paul Manafort, I found his spool of his daughter's texts that were hacked by uh, Ukrainians and uh, put out in the dark net. I happened upon them and started mining them for all kinds of fun things, including his password of 007. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've since the uh, election cycle, I spent a little more time on Russia looking into what they're doing. I'd already had a, a good history with them, you know, about them. But um, Manafort thing came up. I also found in, a, in another uh, email dump in the dark net, a uh, full accounting of how Russia had set up their own kind of like an RT, kind of a press group in Ukraine that was specifically made as a disinformation and um, psyops campaign group. And I got all their uh, financial documents and stuff, put it out on the net. It was sometime after one of those two things, and they came pretty close together when I started writing about them, uh, that the 4 or 5 fun must have happened because somebody from Russia who actually reads my blog sent me a message saying, hey, you're blocked in Russia. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he sent me the screenshot. So, yay me. Waiting for my polonium enema. Anyway, uh, what is espionage? Since we're talking about espionage, or that's the theme of this uh, conference, I wanted to kind of go back and take a, a broader look at the history of espionage, what it's really about, and how overall we fit into this picture now as security professionals, as hackers. Some of, the, some of you may in the, in the room might actually work for, you know, the government. So what is espionage? Well, as Google puts it, it is the use of spies, people, to gather or steal information from others. This has, for the most of the time, been military or governmental secrets, but that has evolved over time 
just as the notion of spying or espionage has since the dawn of civilization. Espionage at its heart, though, is the use of people and now digital tools or code to steal information from others for the benefit of not only nation states, but private companies or individuals today. I put this keynote together for Circle City Con uh, to discuss espionage from the earliest mentions of its use in warfare up to today's uses in the digital world, where everything is hyper-connected. Industrial espionage has become a huge weapon in the geopolitical and private space today, giving insight and a leg up on things for corporations, individuals, and governments. Corporations now hire out their own digital spies and have used school, uh, old school espionage in the past, but now governments are nakedly stealing data to give to their home country's companies as a means to a financial and political gain. Governments and militaries have and are using espionage, digital and other, to not only steal secrets, but to manipulate people too. People, companies, governments, and militaries uh, of their opponents. These uh, spy campaigns now can affect outcomes of things like elections, destroy infrastructure, and manipulate the press using the digital space as well as the meat space to affect these goals. But what I really wanted to do with this keynote is to give you a bigger picture of espionage. I wanted to disabuse some of you out there that may think you are spies. Some of you might actually be a kind of spy working for the government or in the private sector. Most of you, though, really likely aren't spies, but instead security professionals or hackers. You aren't James Bond. You're not George Smiley, but you may be on the front lines of a shadow war, and some of you might not even know it. So, Espionage has been called the second oldest uh, profession. <laughs> the first uh, is prostitution, and uh, we won't go into that. Uh, from the dawn of civilization, we have reports of espionage, uh, espionage's use by Greeks, Romans, Persians, Chinese, and others. Herodotus, the father of history, has outlined for us an example of spies in these early times. Herodotus on the Greek spies in the Sardis. The Greek spies arrived in Sardis and found out all they could about the king's army, but were caught in the process, questioned by the Persian military commanders, and condemned to death. But when Xerxes was told that they were about to be executed, he disapproved of his general's decision and sent men from his bodyguard with others to get hold of the three spies. If they are still alive and bring them before him, as the sentence had not yet been carried out, this was done. The spies were brought to the king, who, having satisfied himself about the reasons for their presence in the Sardis, instructed his guards to take them round and let them see the whole army, infantry, cavalry. And then, when they were satisfied that they had seen everything, to let them go without molestation to whatever country they pleased. After giving this order, he explained the purpose of, its, of it by pointing out that if the spies had been executed, the Greeks would not have been able to learn in good time how incalculably great the Persian strength was. And the killing of three men who would not have done the enemy much harm, but if, on the other hand, the spies returned home, he was confident that their report on the magnitude of the Persian power would induce the Greeks to surrender their liberty before actual invasion took place so that there would be no need to go to the trouble of fighting war at all. What Herodotus was describing here uh, is that is what we today would call human. The spies gathered the intelligence of Xerxes' army's strength and reported back to their commanders. Of course, Xerxes was overconfident, and that would be his undoing later by Themistocles, but that's another story. So classical espionage, many of you probably know the imagery here. Um, espionage has always had much of the same goals throughout uh, time. It is to collect or steal information to give an edge to those parties the spies work for. 
As you can see, it is an old profession by the passage from Herodotus and the Sardis. Many of you are probably more familiar with the more contemporary ideas of spying from the Cold War, or maybe World War II, where the OSS was formed and fought uh, against Germany. The precepts have always been the same and remain so in today's spying, but it seems that technology has allowed for the use of espionage to be a purview, not just of nation states anymore, but also of the individual as well. The new barrier for entry in espionage today seems to be to the ability just to point, click, download malware, and send a pre-made fish. Human, on the other hand, is a bit different. Spies before the digital revolution have usually been state-sponsored and of the realm of the secret wars between powers. For instance, if you look at the images on the slide, you will see fictionalized characters from John Le Carre's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. These archetypes of spies are closer to the mark than the ones, uh, than one might think. In fact, Le Carre, or David Cornwell, was in fact a spy working for MI5 before writing his novels. As such, he writes about them in a way that is very close to reality. In a world of spies and espionage before the digital age, it was focused on human, human intelligence, gathering it from people, not just digitally stealing information from a computer. Human is all about people working with other people as sources. To get someone to give up or steal information, insert bad information, or other kinds of operations were the norm. But it was, the, for the most part, done in person, interacting with people without an element of technology as we do today. The technology relied on then consisted of ways usually to exfiltrate information securely out of the enemy territory or to conceal messages to and from operatives in the field from prying eyes. This type of espionage still goes on today, but, uh, but unfortunately it has taken a backseat to technologies that just carry out the espionage through SIGINT or ELINT, electronic information gathering. Uh, and from my point of view, we've lost something. There's, there's much still to be said about human interaction and intelligence gathering, but since the 90s we have lost our edge. Human is hard, it seems, and there were many kinds of spies needed for day-to-day -day operations. types of spies. Spies come in different types. There are varying kinds of tasks that spies carry out. Some collect information by observing and passing it along. Some are out there recruiting to get information and run agents or assets. And oftentimes these two intersect. There are many names for these kinds of spies, case agents, covert agent, knock agent. Uh, that's not official cover. Uh, handler, targeter, etc. The goal of all of them, though, is to gather information to give to the, anal the analysts who then brief those in charge to help them make decisions in the government. On uh, other non-governmental spies might do much the same, but pass the information on to those who are paying for it privately. Or one could go the ancient words of Sunsa, which I'm kind of loath to use Sunsa, it's really overused, but... Uh, and consider the types of spies in this way. This is a quoting from Sun Tzu. What types of spies are there? Sun Tzu had the definition, a definitive answer. Hence, the use of spies of whom there are five classes. Local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, and surviving spies. From these kinds of arcane descriptions, though, you can see what he was talking about. There are uh, spies you recruit from the local populace that you're attacking. There are inward spies. Uh, these are the people inside a government or a military. There are converted spies, the spies you catch and then you make them double agents, you turn them. Um, and lastly, you have the doomed uh, and the surviving spies. And, and really what that means is just to, if you're going to burn somebody, you're going to burn somebody and you never had any intention of keeping them around. A surviving spy is the one you want to keep. So anybody you're running like an asset in Russia, you, you want to eventually exfiltrate them out because they're worth something and you're actually dealing with them. Today, though, there has been an overuse of the word spy and of the idea of what a spy is. With all this technology, people think that if you penetrate a system, you are a de facto spy. 
This is not necessarily the case, and as hackers or security professionals, you should know the differences between uh, differences before making the claim. It is also problematic that much of the security industry has a penchant for using military jargon. Espionage terms and ideas have been added to the mix, like tradecraft, which for me just makes everything we do a little more word salady. Um, in fact, when you call yourself a ninja, you're calling yourself a spy. Unless you are from Iga or Koga and several hundred years old, you're not. Just out of curiosity, you all know who these people are? No, that's uh, Valerie Plain. She worked for the CIA as a knock agent. She was burned by George W. Bush, Scooter Libby. Uh, the one on the right is from the Americans. She's a handler uh, for the uh, Russian agents in place in America. I forget her name in the show. And the bottom is uh, Nada Bakos. And she's one of the ones that helped find uh, Osama bin Laden. She's a targeter. She was a full knock. And she's a handler. So just to give you that context. So on to tradecraft. Tradecraft is a word you'll hear today in the information security circles that isn't co-opted from the military and the espionage world. What tradecraft means in the spying world has been practices and technologies by which spies ply their trade. Uh, while the original, original tradecraft of yesterday would mean code making and concealment, how to use a dead drop, or how to lose the surveillance team, it has been adapted to the technological means to defeat detection of hacking and, and uh, infiltrating and controlling systems, keeping persistence. Much of the tradecraft in digital espionage centers on technical understanding of operating systems and how to manipulate systems, not people. A caveat to that would be the social engineer uh, in the InfoSec area, but really how many red teams are actually recruiting insiders as assets to actively steal secrets from them knowingly? If you want to think about it in terms of an analogy, one could make the illusion of compromising a system, recruiting an asset. You find the weakness uh, and exploit it. You interrogate the system for information. You exfiltrate the data, and then you keep persistence, like I said. But that is about the extent of the reality. Uh, tradecraft, otherwise, is a list of processes and procedures to ensure that you succeed in compromising a system and keeping it. Of course, in real espionage, tradecraft, you need to use it to protect yourself and your assets. Um, if you don't, you can end up dead or they can end up dead. The term Moscow rules, for example, really had possible life and death consequences for the asset person you're running, person you're recruiting as a spy, um, because, you, you know, if you don't keep your tradecraft well, you could lead the KGB right to your, your asset. Suddenly they go bye-bye. Um, the tradecraft of concealment of what the operative was doing in a hostile environment like Moscow was paramount to having a successful operation. If you blow a digital operation, hacking a system in a hostile country, it may not lead to a bullet in the back of the head of somebody in Lubyanka, that's what I'm saying. Which brings us to when things started to change in spying. As secrets became more readily stolen through technological means, like phones and cables, uh, their use augmented the human intelligence and made agents' lives a little bit easier. Electronic espionage. Of course, as technologies came along, the use of them to carry out espionage allowed for a shift in spying. The telephone and the radio both made seismic changes in how we uh, collected information, as well as getting it from human sources. Now the pivot was those humans that were not that were being recruited were also being listened to as well, surreptitiously. Basically, we went from having star chambers opening mail to engaging telecommunication companies like Bell into giving us access to international cable traffic. 
Secrets were being stolen directly from those who held them without their knowledge, and it was good. Listening devices or bugs became an integral part of espionage, augmenting the information being given by sources and gave us a bigger picture of what was going on in the adversary's camp. Why recruit everyone when you can just implant a bug in their office or get their cables delivered to you from the company carrying them? Does this sound familiar to you today? It seems that this is still the key to much of the espionage we carry out. We listen in or we look over the shoulders of those we want to spy on. It became a passive thing in the sense of, uh, in, in one sense, and in another it became an aggressive uh, means in creating a way to hack somebody's data, tap them, and just steal it. Um, activities that before you had to really recruit somebody to get you know, into a hard target. Of course, one still needed human intelligence agents to sometimes get the bugs into the places where they were most needed. In one case, uh, for instance, the great seal of the United States was given to a U.S. ambassador in, uh, to the Soviet Union in 1945 by the Young Pioneers, and that's a, uh, like Cub Scouts in Russia, but much more indoctrinating into, you know, government. This device housed a theremin listening device made by Leon Theremin, the guy from the Star Trek theme. It successfully bugged the ambassador's study until its discovery in 1954. And, you know, basically we got some people coming in saying, here's a present, and they went, great, and he put it in his own study. It's that simple. But it took somebody giving it to him to do it. Wouldn't like a, you know, if you just got an Amazon package today, would you... Just hang it up in your office, I don't know. It was the time when you had to implant devices to listen in. Now you just have to drop code. Then things really changed. Once the computer came to be, and they became networked via phone connections or networks, the paradigm in spying really shifted. What was once considered to be a secret in a secure area within a military base or a think tank was now available to anyone who knew how to hack. We went from holding data in a safe in a room with a guard to a computer connected to the internet with an IP stack. In essence, not secure at all. For some reason, we all thought it was secure because it was digital and it was, you know, who could do that? Who could figure that out? At least from the perspective at the time. This changed for many in 1986 when an astronomer named Cliff Stoll found that the computer in his university was being hacked due to charges for time on the system, the mainframe, via the school's accounting department. With that, he became an unwitting sleuth that discovered a Russian agent hacking into the university system to access military secrets and networks on connected bases elsewhere via ARPANET which had just been connected together. It was now possible to cut out the human altogether, save for the hacker, to access data and steal it for your country. This change, the networking of the world, was just the start of all, what you, of all you see happening today. You all out there know what it is like today. Anything networked is susceptible to attack, as well as those in air gap systems that someone can physically access, or in some cases, you can listen to and, you know, get the clicks out of a hard drive, things like that, keyboard clicks, any other uh, emanations. Pandora was not only out of the box, she was wreaking havoc every time someone connected a computer to the network or saved a file to a drive. And network they did. From, uh, from early military university networks, we have the Internet today. Built not to be secure, but redundant in case of a nuclear attack, and a free highway for adversaries looking to not only steal information, but perhaps now carry out degrade and deny operations as well. Everything went digital, and espionage began a new golden age. Digital espionage. From all of this connectivity, we have seen the floodgates open to any number of attacks. Nation states are stealing corporate data to give to their own companies to get ahead. 
military and government uh, powers are stealing information on countries' readiness as well as plans for aircraft and other hardware for reverse engineering to keep the, the military parity as well. We have military warfare, uh, electronic warfare, economic warfare, cyber warfare, information warfare, and the list goes on. Still, other adversaries are using the digital battle space to have psychological and kinetic effects as espionage goals. The line between espionage and war has been always been a little bit blurred, but it seems today that the line has been completely erased in the digital age. We're using technology to have direct effects on people solely using code and hacking skills. The end user is the target of the digital spy as much as corporate uh, corporations or governments. There may be a, uh, no need for a person to meet the target in real life. All they need to do now is send them an email or a LinkedIn invite to gather the initial access and recruit them unwittingly. We all have uh, become useful idiots in a way. All of this now is handled by people behind anonymous keyboards. But consider the day when it was augmented, if not taken over by AI. Then there will be no human element whatsoever. The times, they are changing, and so are the spies. Um, and just for your edification, JSF, that's the Chinese version. They stole all the data and they made their own. Nothing like going to a Paris air show and seeing your own plane take off with Chinese you know, symbols on it. Uh, types of digital spies. Today's digital spies come in a few different types. You have those who are actively compromising systems, those who are targeting those systems or footprinting, those who are creating the software, and those who are managing the infrastructure. These are all bear kinship to the designations and jobs I mentioned earlier, but for the most part, the only human interaction uh, they have is not with the targets, but instead each other in their teams. It takes a team of digital spies to carry out an espionage operation, and these people work in cells inside agencies like the NSA, the GRU, the CIA. Teams of tech, uh, technical people and logicians work together to compromise systems and networks, to gather intelligence and pass the data to linguists and analysts. These skills are not soft skills dealing with social interactions and methods that a human specialist would use, and as such are quite different from those in the field. For the most part, a Tau operative would not be in the field as much as behind a desk in Fort Meade or San Antonio, reaching out across the world to access networks uh, and data by way of exploiting them. Sometimes, though, there is a, a melding of the two kinds of spies with a, a field operative that has technical skills. Technicians on SSG, which is the special surveillance group at the FBI, for one uh, instance, might have agents who are technically skilled and go out on assignments in the field. CIA technical services group as well would have these kinds of people able to go on site and access a system as part of a team However, they would not be out recruiting human assets and carrying out tradecraft other than technical operations. Of course, all of these examples are from governmental agencies, nations against nation spying, which makes them spies because they are governmentally sanctioned and work for the likes of the CIA or the NSA. This is a key difference between our community and the real world of espionage. We may have some of the same kinds of players digitally, but we aren't actually spies. Um, unless you're, I would say, working for a government agency or even a private agency that's you know, kind of um, affiliated or off the radar, off the reservation, you want to, where, where do you want to call it, um, because you're, you're getting into a legal territory. Assets uh, who can be passively listening or actively exploding things, too. Active and passive espionage. For a long time, the use of espionage, both digitally and analog, had been more passive. Stealing data from, had been the mainstay of many nations via hacking. Lately, though, that bit has been flipped by the likes of Russia to a more forward footing. 
As you may have heard, the term active measures are new, the new rage. And with that, both sides of the coin are leveraged. You steal data and you use it actively to affect outcomes. In the digital space, it, it may be easier to affect greater change or cause damage due to asymmetrical, the asymmetrical nature of the medium. In the case of Stuxnet, the U.S., Israel, and Britain managed to affect the political and technical landscape of Iran by sabotaging their ability to refine radioactive materials with malware. Code prevented the Iranian regime from becoming a nuclear power for years. It set them back uh, two or five years. I can't remember the exact uh, measurement that they gave. Russia has used code to attack the grid system in Ukraine and disrupt their election systems on election day. Other countries have attacked banking systems like the Iranians in reprisal for Natanz, too. The switch has been easier to flip from passive intelligence collection to active measures and kinetic outcomes from the use of networks and code because everything connected is vulnerable now. But with every paradigm change that comes to light within a battle space, new countermeasures are created. The tradecraft of one can spawn the countermeasure of another and defeat those attacks. The great game of espionage, as it has been referred to in the past, continues on in the digital realm. What you all have to understand now is that you are a piece on that playing field, whether you like it or not. If, a, if you have access or have a device that can be leveraged, then you are a combatant. Anyone now can be a target of digital espionage. Whether you work for the government or a company that makes something that a hostile government wants, how many people at Sony ever thought that they would be a target of a nation-state attack over a political beef? You all are now in the middle of not just your work systems, uh, in the middle, and not just in your work systems. If you or your system can be recruited, witting or not, to be an asset of an uh, espionage campaign, then you might find yourself in the middle of an international incident. The targeting also can just be digital, not just digital, but human as well, even today. Human is still very important, even if many are not enamored with hacking to see it. So on to human again in today's world. So human intelligence. In talking about uh, digital espionage, I want to also cover this, that sliver of area where human still plays a role in espionage in the digital sphere. A primary area that I am acquainted with are the terrorists on the Internet. Many of these players are not digitally as savvy as most, which is changing, but are online trying to hide their real identities while posting all kinds of crap. These kinds of operations require using social engineering as well as other technical and social tradecraft to insert yourself into their networks, recruit assets wittingly or unwittingly. This can also require the technical skills of a hacker to attempt to compromise their systems or to track them online. So we're seeing this merging of uh, abilities. The same soft skills are still use, still in use by traditional espionage that not only play out in the digital realm, but into the meat space as well. Um, outside the usual box of pen testing, you may, you all may be acquainted with the, um, acquainted with. Imagine that you not only just try to compromise someone's computer, but actively recruit an asset through the internet to trick others into carrying out attacks on systems inside their network. Kind of like phishing, but a little more active. A good example of this kind of work also would be the highs and lows of the Russian troll farm that played a part in the 2016 election uh, active measures campaign. While the depth of the asset management and soft skills may not have been as deep, there were times when the targets, when the agents of the IRA were actively recruiting people on Twitter and Reddit uh, as well as an email to actions in the real world. One instance even had an activist get money from an IRA agent, create all kinds of uh, materials, and go out and have a, uh, you know, a thing on the street, which really didn't pay off. But they tried, and this guy actually fell for it and uh, was an unwitting agent for the... Uh, GRU over politics. 
As we move forward uh, post-2016, we should expect to see more of this kind of activity and not only that not only reaches out to people on social media, but as that transfer to local action, as well as making those people who actively carry out events to be useful idiots for the GRU or for other spy organizations. The human element still is still very important, as we have seen in recent events of active measures in hybrid warfare. So hybrid warfare, active measures, probably two terms you've heard in the news. Um, the Senate and the House reports. Um, so where does that come from? This brings us to the next turning in the digital warfare and SBI space. As we saw in 2016, Russia used the Internet to attack the American electoral process. The use of the digital domain has gone from outright spying to steal and stealing IP to actively using it for disinformation and active measures campaigns to cause chaos and uh, potentially regime change, which it seems it worked here. Once again, the lines of espionage and warfare have been erased by the technology of the networked device and now social media. Valerie Gerasimov made the comment on this on the slide you see here. And, um, and though many would consider him the creator of what they call the Gerasimov Doctrine, of which there is no document, if you go look for it, it doesn't exist, it's made up by whoever wrote that up. Um, he made some posits in a different paper, but there is no doctrine. Um, he made the connection of using these espionage techniques and tools from the information warfare space as a precursor to invasion. His idea was that you often, uh, you soften the target up, cause chaos, debilitate them technically and kinetically, and you may not even have to send in troops. Given what has happened since Trump won, you can see how effective this can be on the world stage. Consider now that all of these systems and assets one, uh, one would attack are things you use every day. The grid, the news, social media, your car, your phone, your toaster. Everything that is networked today, if, uh, everything that is networked today. If Facebook has made you the product, Jurassic has done the same for you as a pawn in the greater game of espionage and warfare. So it is no longer just your phone, your computer, your toaster, or your car that is the uh, target of this kind of espionage and warfare, it is now your psyche and your ability to reason. If anything, we have seen over the last couple of years that even without hacking, just by putting out fake storylines, one can cause great damage. And while this is all going on, it is all of you out there, out here in the community, making new exploits, having conferences, giving ammunition to the spy and the warfare community, too. You see, hackers started all this by being inquisitive and breaking things. We do have some culpability to everything that is happening now as well. Which brings me to hackers and spies. So here we are in this conference today themed on spying. And you might be thinking a bit differently about what spies are and what technology has done to espionage. You here in this audience are not average users by any means. You are a harder target for espionage on average, but you are likely more susceptible to being targeted by a nation state because of your skills. Some of you might be thinking out there right now, who, me? I just work blue team for Staples. But the reality is that if you hold the keys to networks, that have access to information that an adversary wants, they will attempt to leverage you as well as the average government functionary. Given some of the fish that are out there by adept adversaries, can you even say for sure that they have not tried to get you? Have you detected their attacks? Have you stopped them? Is this even something that you've considered? Those out there who are doing pen testing and red teaming, you too could be a target. In fact, you might be a high value target for a nation state. These spies might not only use technical measures to attempt to steal from you though. You might have an actual asset they would like to recruit and you might not be even know that you're it. 
In fact, if you've been to DEF CON, you've likely come into contact with spies from ours and other countries. That guy you might be drinking with and going clubbing with could in fact be a traditional spy trying to see if you are worth recruiting and recruitable. In another way, what if you work daily on making exploits or testing for vulnerabilities on common systems? Would you not be a tasty target for a spy plot to steal your O-Day or recruit you to make something new, something for a foreign power? It's not inconceivable, really. In fact, a few years back, a bunch of hackers attended a party in Vegas for DEF CON. What they didn't know was that the party was hosted by a hostile foreign power looking to see who they might recruit. Hackers, hacktivists, security researcher, all are targets of espionage. Activists and spies. This is where it gets fun. White hats aren't the only targets of nation state uh, might want to attack or recruit. Those out there who are part of the arcology of hacktivists are prime targets for espionage. These actors can be used to gather intelligence, be used to use as cutouts or emulated to make an active cam uh, measure or campaign look like it was them instead of the nation state that actually pulled it off. In the case of Anonymous, there was a subset that have taken on the name and the methods of Anonymous to further their own political agendas, such as the jihadis of the cyber caliphate or non-ghost. They have many names, but in uh, some cases, their names are only covers for operations of the GRU. Hacking into facing pages for political giggles could also be used as disinformation campaigns by the likes of Russia or anyone else who deems it useful uh, to scapegoat them and to make a, a statement. Enhance their scare factor, let's say. Sometimes active groups are infiltrated digitally as well as literally by individual spies to gather intelligence and affect operations. Sometimes those spies are actually double agents like Sabu, who took down Lulsec as a cooperating informant and actively worked with the FBI to collect intel on all the players and help them arrest them all to stop them from causing more damage. It turns out that in Anonymous, you really aren't so anonymous. And that can lead to double agents putting you in the pokey. The same can, uh, bad outcomes can happen when a nation state uses you for their own purposes and you later get out of, uh, get put in prison for hacking something that someone you thought was on your team told you to hack. Kind of like what happened with Lulsec. Consider this too. WikiLeaks started out as a self-proclaimed force of good. It has since been co-opted by the KGB. I still call them that. They're not the FSB. They don't change their spots. In Russia, as a tool of propaganda and active measures against the U.S. in a hybrid war. All, you, all of you could be used in the same way. So now we have a hybrid warfare going on. In previous slides, I talked about active measures and the precepts, uh, precepts of the Gerasimov Doctrine, all of the actions that took place online and off in the 2016, uh, in 2016 compromise, uh, comprise the doctrine that Jas Gerasimov uh, posited of fighting a war using espionage and active measures without having to deploy troops. The active measures campaign of hacking the DNC, leaking the information to WikiLeaks, and the use of a cutout called Guccifer 2.0 are a hybrid warfare that use digital espionage for its end. The internet and any systems connected is now a player in the digital battlefield, and you, as the user of that system, are a pawn. Within this kind of warfare, the use of uh, many tried and true disciplines of old school warfare can be used as a force amplifier due to the nature of the medium, asymmetric nature. We saw this up close and personal in the troll farm operation in the WikiLeaks dumps in 2016. <clears throat> then candidate Trump and his minions also began to use the same tools of leaks, disinformation, and psyops to incite their bases, uh, their base, and all the, while Russia spun the plate faster and faster too. The outcome of it all, um, of all that you are too, all too familiar with today, Gerasimov posited that one could destabilize a country by using hacking, disinformation, propaganda, and psyops. 
Russia then proved them right. The twist with the, the Russians was that they mobilized all this data that was stolen along with cutout accounts on social media to carry out disinformation campaigns or Zinfomatsnaya against the U.S. and our electoral uh, system at large. Disinformation that, according to James Clapper, uh, likely turned the corner on Trump winning the electoral college by engaging his base and inciting the spectrum of people in the U.S. Clapper's comment recently, uh, not the government line, but he's a private citizen now. So if you're paying attention to that whole debate, um, it's easily conceivable that Trump's electoral win, which was very slim in the sense of, you know, 80,000 80, votes, I think it was, that all of this disinformation, all the active measures could have turned that tide. Everyone seems to be focused on, okay, well, they hacked the election, election systems, the, uh, the websites, they had the access to the, the voter rolls, but there's no proof that they did anything else. So the disinformation, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term and the, you know, the actual sense of it being used uh, in a military kind of milieu, but the definition of disinformation is the use of false information that is intended to mislead, especially propaganda issued by a government organization to a rival power or media. What was once a problem for the news media, disinformation in the digital age, has broken out into being mean, a means that everyone with a computer, a blog, uh, a phone, can disinform the masses with, for their own purposes. So you can carry out your own disinformation campaign if you want. You can buy a bunch of bots, do it. Uh, I personally have done it, small, small use against uh, some people. But, you know, you can do it. Daily now, the President of the United States uses Twitter to disinform his constituency, em emulating the narratives of Fox News, Reddit threads, from the likes of QAnon, and others attempt to pass off bogus stories as reality and inflame those who are willing to believe them into action at the polls, at the very least, and at the worst, into physical action. Some of the attacks we've been seeing, stuff that happened in um, North Carolina. Disinformation in the new digital age uh, of espionage entails not only manipulating social media narratives, but soon enough, if not already, inserting fake data into them as well in hopes that no one would be able to deny the fa their false nature. In point of fact, of the data dumped by Gucci for 2.0 contain, uh, contained faked documents inserted into the dump to disinform people about Hillary Clinton as well. It was only once the metadata was checked that the fraudulent claims were um, deflated. All of this is happening online in your space and is fairly easy to carry out uh, as an actor with some money and some time. Russia so far has been the preeminent user of these tactics and methods, but soon enough others will follow suit. Of course, others may be a bit more subtle about, about it and who knows what the fallout might be from a greater campaign carried out by uh, some other well funded government actors. All of this made, uh, all of this though is made easier because the digital medium is a mystery to the general populace who are unable to or unwilling to dig further for the truth. And that's something uh, we were discussing at lunch today is you got the internet, you got all this information, but first, can you trust it anymore? And second, do you know how to find it? And third, if you find it, can you delineate between what is truth and what is fiction? You know, history is written by the winners of the battle, the war. Is it true because it's in a history book or has it been manipulated per country? You know, your history book might say something different than another country's history book. Just saying. Uh, but wait, it gets darker still when you uh, start manipulating people's fears and psyches with psyops. Ooh. Here's the good stuff. So part of those disinformation operations are PSYOPs campaigns. PSYOPs, psychological operations, 
have been a mainstay of espionage since the advent of newspapers, leaflets, radio, and TV. However, in the new digital space, we have blogs and all other means of dissemination via video, audio, text, what have you. Alex Jones, when not hawking his male vitality herbals, is one of the more prolific users of PSYOPs. Whether he is an asset knowingly of a nation state like Russia has yet to be determined. However, look at what he spins out there and the way he does it. He's trying to strike terror as well as incite worship from those weak-minded enough to believe his shtick. While he yells about governmental uh, governments carrying out PSYOPs against him and his people, he's carrying them out against his people. In fact, one of the things, uh, well, <laughs> one of the more crazy things, and, and people believe this shit, I don't know why, um, he says the government is full of globalist lizard people. It's, it, it's not V. It's not the 80s. It's not a TV show. It's exactly what a lizard person would say. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. In fact, one of the things he has put out there is a direct Russian black propaganda operation concerning the CIA's creating AIDS. I kid you not. This line, uh, line of story came from Russia back in the 80s once AIDS became prevalent and is still being pimped by the likes of Jones and others. You can see the CIA guys making AIDS. RT2 is used not only as an outlet for disinformation, but also plays at the psyche strings of those believers feeding them a steady diet of ideas and stories to cause cognitive dissonance. What about ism is one of their specialties. And you, you can see it when Trump uses it all the time, too. You know, what a, there was a spy in my, my operation. No, there wasn't. But now he's gaining attention on this. It's been recently reported through polling that more people believe now there was some sort of spy in his campaign, but not a Russian spy, a DOJ spy. It's nuts. We're, we're through the looking glass. A good example of a PSYOP uh, with a digital implementation was carried out by Russia and Ukraine in 2014. Protesters in Kiev were protesting uh, Russian interference in their country when everyone with a cell phone got, uh, at the protest got a text note saying that they were part of a mass riot. This was an attempt to quell the dissent and a threat to those with the text that Russia knew who they were and where they lived in hopes that they would break it up. That didn't really work because Maidan happened later on, but you can see what, what they're getting to. Ubiquitous technology has allowed for the hybrid war to reach a very personal, uh, very personally to anyone on the network to scare them, spy on them, or to disinform them in a hybrid war that could become very kinetic Kinetic meaning that you could be targeted by a drone or disappeared by a government. So we've got this new term. I don't know if anyone's actually coined it. <laughs> Hybrid kinetic war information warfare. I detest the word cyber. Trying not to use it. I don't think I used it too much here. Um, it means sex. It's not. OK. So where is all this going? With the tools and techniques of hacking and espionage in tandem with the disinformation and kinetic attacks via digital domain, we have ourselves in an existential crisis. And by existential, I mean more philo philosophically than life and death, though it has come to that in certain circumstances, like some Iranian nuclear scientist being blown up in a car in Iran or um, a, GCQ, a GCHQ analyst being found stuffed in a gym bag dead. With all these tools in the hands of those actors, nation state and other, we could be in a real, we could be in real trouble here. The cumulative efforts, effects of uh, Russian attacks on our electoral system did in fact aid Trump to victory in the U.S. It's my personal opinion. The outcomes of that election are still being played, but in as much as they are, uh, they've been seen so far, we have become a weakened power on the world stage and are still too fragmented to really effectively wield power during and after his reign. Um, and one caveat is this morning or yesterday, 
it was yesterday, I was, I was on, in between flights and heard that he had decided to ban all BMWs from being sold in the United States and this huge tariff war. And he's just fucking nuts. But by doing all of this, it places our ability to project power in the world or to work with other countries to project power on other nation states that are like North Korea, it's all being fractured. And the chaos is everywhere. He is a chaos monkey. What else might an adversary like Russia do given that these measures have worked so well and that the means to counter them seems to be so non-existent? The norms over cyber warfare, there's the cyber, or information warfare are, are as yet weak, and it seems like in our current state we will be unable to complete uh, them and promulgate them to the world because of the fractious nature of today's political landscape. Indeed, it all can go very kinetic, now from the digital space. Everything is connected, uh, everything's hackable, right? Some of these stories out there are true that you could actually blow up pressurized tanks of oil or other flammable liquid, liquids by messing with PLCs. You could probably cause deaths abusing technologies by hacking them and inserting code just as much as digital GPS data gathered uh, live from a phone. This actually happened to Junaid Hussein in Syria. He was uh, a few slides back under the human slide. None of these, uh, none of us here are likely to mourn this jihadi, but consider if the technology were turned on uh, on you by a hostile government, how would you feel about that? So finally, where do we go from here? Uh, let's sum up what we have so far. We live in a world where it is easy to, easy to disinform, distract, and distort, and cause chaos with information alone. We also have a system of networked objects that can be used to take down other systems and cause more chaos that reaches into the real world. It can affect by denying access to resources like telco and power and be without power. So there's a, a real, real life element that you're starting to see. Although, I mean, Ukraine is probably the best example of taking a grid down almost completely. Here it's a little more difficult because of so many different companies. But you have to consider at this time, we also have all our personal information in the hands of corporations. They're selling it to whoever has the money. For that matter, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica showed us that not only would they sell the data, but they would sell it to a company that actively claimed they carried out psyops and propaganda campaigns for dictators. Sweet. Plus, when the information isn't being sold for profit, it is being stolen by the likes of uh, nation states like China for their own purposes of espionage from places like OPM. You have an SF-86, it's theirs. They know where you live, they know who, who your relatives are, they know all of it. We're also, uh, we also seem to have a problem with persistence of an anonymity and privacy as well. That said, same information uh, that is being collected, sold and stolen by all kinds of actors seems to be the standard now, even if we don't want the custodian of the data to keep or sell it in the first place. Even recently, the notion of live GPS tracking of our phones being sold to whoever paid for it is in the news as a company has been doing so without thought about privacy of patients at all. We are, my friends, in a digital panopticon, subject to espionage, theft, misuse, and now active measures by foreign powers in digital wars we did not sign up for. These are being actively leveraged against the general populations now because of the technologies we all carry and are all slaves to. We are the product for corporations while we are the targets for those actors who want to spy on us, manipulate us, and carry out various kinds of warfare against us. Welcome to the great game of digital espionage, my friends. Maybe it would just be better to play a nice game of chess. That's it.
I wrote a lot. <laughs>